I am uh, very happy to be welcoming uh, Sue Entress and Bill Booth from the uh, Bainbridge Island Rowing Group today. Uh, the, the rowing club has been working on uh, getting their new boathouse in order. And today we're going to talk about one of the crown jewels of that building, uh, which is sitting in it, but not quite mounted yet, which is a uh, traditional <laughs> shell. And Bill has been involved in uh, preserving the pre preservation work. So um, I don't know, Sue, if uh, you as the uh, board president would like to say a little something about what it is that we're going to talk about today. Sure. And first off, I apologize. I started out with a camera and evidently it didn't like the way I looked, so it turned me off. <laughs> it's, it's It must be a free service that Google provides if you're not looking at your back and <laughs> shut the camera. <laughs> um, uh, so the Pocock, so the uh, first of all, I think you're all aware that we're building the rowing center right across from you. And um, part of it, a part of our plan was to provide a, a place for our programs which operates, which is the lower part of the rowing center and, and someday the upper part, which is kind of the plan is to be a space that the community can use and we can also use it for um, erging and workouts, but everything can be tucked away uh, into a closet so that it could also be used for events and weddings and possibly, you know, we're looking at all the uses now. Um, our main goal is just to get to where we can use it for other things, just to get the build out. So we, we actually there's a little bit of a backstory. We started construction on the rowing center before we had full funds for it because um, the city was starting the redesign of Waterfront Park and we had to integrate ourselves into that design. So we got started right away, got the downstairs completed, um, and then it came time to decide how we wanted to dedicate this rowing center and were approached by the uh, Pocock family that's Stan Pocock's family. His father obviously was George Pocock, who's a legendary boat builder and in the Pacific Northwest. And his son carried on his tradition and also had an amazing legacy of coaching and building community rowing programs. And we at Bainbridge Island Rowing felt like that was a great, he's a, had a great story past and it was a great way to introduce our junior athletes, especially not just our younger people, not just to what's going on now, but that there's a whole history of it to sort of tie in, you know, the last almost 100 years of the sport and the people that have worked to get it where it is. And the, you know, a lot of these kids have never even seen a wooden boat. They certainly never rode in one because they've all been fiberglass. So, um, as we get into the upstairs, we were trying to figure out how to really meaningfully integrate the history of Pacific Northwest rowing with what we've got today. And we were given this rowing shell, one of the ones that um, George and his son built in 1949 uh, by Rat Island Rowing, which is out of Port Townsend. They row out of the, the Center for Wooden Boats. Um, and it's just a beautiful vessel. You know, truth be told, it's, it, I think it's still rowable. I'll turn it over to Bill Booth to answer that question, but <laughs> it's really heavy. <laughs> um, and uh, that's probably the main reason why these fiberglass shells that can be carried down to the water are more practical. Um, but so we were given this boat in kind of a state of disrepair and through a collaboration of some really knowledgeable folks at Bainbridge Island Rowing and ditto for skilled and knowledgeable folks at the barn, uh, Bainbridge Artisans Network, Resource Network. Um, they restored it and that's the backstory. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Bill Booth to talk about the magic that was done. <clears throat> well, to say it was restored is not quite uh, uh, on the mark because uh, it really is not rollable. It has uh, two cracks in the hull that are sort of beyond repair. Um, no, our goal was to uh, preserve it, uh, which meant uh, getting rid of some mold and uh, some try to get away some black spots and uh, make it look as though it were uh, nearly ready to row, let's say. Um, entailed uh, doing a lot of uh, Oh, I think we had a crew of four 
uh, scraping and sanding for two days. Um, and then pretty much, uh, and then there's some, some of the barn folks uh, pitched in with some excellent woodworking and repaired some broken wooden parts uh, and back into some good order. Uh, and eventually, after we got the boat um, in and out of barn, which was no mean feat in itself, and I'll, let me digress there for a moment to say, uh, barn was the only place uh, in their woodworking shop, uh, the only place on the island where we could uh, safely put a 66 foot long boat. Uh, and they wonderfully pitched in uh, with all kinds of help and expertise and cleared the shop. And in the course of uh, occupying the shop for two weeks, uh, we got it out of there. And that in itself was pretty nifty. We had to remove one uh, window that uh, was 19 inches wide, uh, just wide enough to allow us to get the hull in through the window on its side. Can you tell us anything, Bill, about the state of the uh, of the shell when it, when it showed up, where it had been, or what kind of damage it had sustained? I you say it was a cracked hull. Yeah. Um, it was it, it was somewhat the worst for wear, obviously. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, very much worse for wear. Um, some of the uh, sliding seats uh, really were broken, um, and the riggers, the things that hold the oar locks that stick out from the side of the hull, they're called riggers. Uh, some were missing, and uh, our head coach, Bruce Bell, uh, scouted around and scrounged around and talked to various people and they and found, oh yeah, we got a couple of old riggers here. We don't know what they're for. And it looks like they might work on your boat. And so we got the whole thing together. Then he came up with some uh, original wooden oars, which also were hard to find. Uh, and uh, the original rudder and some other artifacts. Um, so we got those things together. Anyway, when it came into the shop, it was uh, uh, in pretty tough shape. Uh, looks like it even had been out in the weather more than it should have been. Uh, there were a lot of blisters on the uh, old varnish uh, and that we're holding water. It was the boat was very very damp. We actually we had to leave it in barn without working on it for oh I think at least a week with fans and dehumidifiers and all kinds of stuff going to try to dry it out. Um, and that we did, uh, and then uh, end of. Was it the end of January, Sue? We moved it out of the out of barn and into the big room at the uh, rowing center. I believe so. Yeah, it was just before they started this phase, so that they could finish building around it. Yeah, that's right. We we uh, we had to get it in through a uh, window uh, at the new rowing center. Well, an opening uh, at the rowing center before the window was installed turns out that was a bit hasty because the windows didn't arrive for two more months but anyhow we <laughs> we did get it in there and uh, a whole bunch of uh, juniors and uh, master rowers uh, I wasn't there but it looks like about 16 people were involved in uh, lifting it out of barn through the window outside onto the trailer down to the boathouse and then back inside. But uh, as we would get it, uh, uh, we got it varnished uh, while in the uh, boathouse, uh, so the hull was nice and dry, and a new deck was put on one end, and one end, one deck was left off, so you could see the brilliant woodworking structure inside. So we may be looking at a picture that shows you some of that under deck area. That's right, that picture right there. Um, 
and the boat will be hung um, upside down. Uh, so you'll be looking up into the the hull and the rowing seats and and the whole business part of the boat. Uh, it's going to be in a location that is will present quite a sensational view. I think uh, we have a corridor that's about uh, forty feet long leading to the great room, which is about 60 feet square. So obviously more of the boat, there's more boat than there is hallway. So we're gonna mount part of it in the hallway and about 20 feet of it will stick out into the great room uh, at about nine or 10 foot elevation above the floor. So is that uh, is that longer than your average shell now, or or not? Uh, no, it's about the same size. Um, it's uh, through trial and error over decades, uh, the designers figured out a way to uh, keep a boat narrow and uh, and uh, long enough uh, with enough displacement to support the weight of the uh, eight pretty, pretty burly men, sort of 180 to 190 pound uh, men. Uh, you wanted a little backstory on the history, perhaps, huh? Yeah, it would be great to, to hear a little bit about uh, this boat and I guess basically the, um, the, the tradition of the, of the Pocock family's boat building. Um, I'll let tradition uh, fall on Sue, but let me say the boat was, uh, as Sue said, built in the late 40s. Uh, it was built as a particularly strong boat. Um, Pocock made a, a number of them, we're told, for uh, the Navy crew, and the University of Washington got one. Um, they, it was used as the freshman crew uh, race boat and uh, one of our own uh, rowing club ancestors uh, Ted Frost was in that freshman crew uh, and his son Kurt is still rowing with us um, that crew went on to uh, to beat uh, Navy that year it was the Olympic year, um, and, and uh, uh, in a regional regatta, but failed to uh, to win the eliminations for the uh, representing the U.S. at the Olympics. Um, but that was quite a remarkable achievement that our freshman crew uh, was able to beat the potential Olympic champions. Um, and then the boat went on to become a practice boat. Uh, then it was, uh, we're told, went to, uh, mm, I think, Bellingham Rowing Club and then to Everett Rowing Club. And then it ended up going back to Port Townsend where one of that original crewmen lived still lives, I think. Um, oh, no, it, no, it didn't. Did it go with Clam Island? No, it went to Port Townsend for the, with the Rat Island Rowing Club. Uh, and eventually, because it was not rowing it, rowable anymore, and uh, the, uh, that owner, whose name escapes me at the moment, was it Harper? Um, heard about our rowing center and... Uh, offered to donate it to us, for which we're very grateful. Yes, no kidding. It'll be a beautiful um, entrance and, uh, and great room um, presentation spot, I'm sure. People will really enjoy being able to see that. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be pretty much of a knockout. Um, a picture you're seeing right now is, uh, says, uh, keep feet off. Um, when a rower gets in the boat, he or she is not to step on the hull per se, but to step on a 
a reinforced plate place uh, in the boat uh, and then sit down on the rowing seat. And so this, this stencil is all over the inside of the boat reminding um, airhead freshmen to uh, keep their <laughs> feet keep, keep their, off the hull. Keep the feet off the hull. Yeah. <laughs> So you want to say more about the uh, Pocock family and uh, and their uh, contribution to rowing and Yeah, I'd be happy to. Am I I can't see my mute buttons. Am I can you hear me? Yes, yep. beautiful. Perfect. Okay. Um yeah, so uh, for any of you that haven't read The Boys in the Boat, um I honestly had not picked it up when I had friends from the East Coast calling to tell me to read it who weren't rowers. So that's when I know it was pretty great. Uh book but it really does talk about sort of the history in the northwest of rowing back before rowers were necessarily you know polished collegiate athletes but in this book you know lumberjacks farmers just big strong young men trying to um that were admitted to college you know given a, a, an education with the opportunity to their rowing gave them the opportunity to go to college so that was the the gist of it. And if you haven't read it, it gives you an insight into not just rowing in the Pacific Northwest, but just life in the Pacific Northwest, you know, back, um, <coughs> uh, back at that time in during what like sort of World War II time period. Um, so what I do know about George Pocock, Stan's father, is that he and his brother came over from England. I think they moved to British Columbia. And again, I'm just trying to remember all this, so don't hold me to it. <laughs> um, but they came to British Columbia, ended up then coming down to build boats over at the Conover Shell House for the University of Washington. I want to say it around uh, 1910, 1920 time period. And then I think during, was it World War One? Um, or World War Two. At some point, then Boeing. What? Sorry, Bill. World War One. World War One. Okay, then then the obviously the rowing sport of rowing kind of died down um, during that time, and Boeing came in and had them um, developing pontoons for their planes out of the same boathouse. So that was a uh, uh, workshop. So they were in that business. Um, and then uh, again, back to there, there was this time in history where rowing, you know, the, the like shores of Lake Washington and the like would align with spectators. And it was like a huge spectator sport, much more so than is the case today. Um, so then he continued to build boats. His uh, then his son, George or Stan, I'm sorry, built boats with him. Um, and then became quite a reputable, uh, you know, kind of an historic rowing coach in his own right. And he coached for the University of Washington. He coached uh, several teams, Bill, you might know more than me, to the Olympics. Um, and just just really continued on with these rowing programs as a, as a rowing coach, um, a passionate rowing coach for years. And then he actually, after his... Uh, wife died, he remarried um, Sue Pocock, who has uh, ties to Bainbridge Island. In fact, her daughter lives here, and his two uh, so granddaughters, Elizabeth and Sarah, were Bainbridge Island rowing rowers themselves. So we have uh, some pictures somewhere of Stan Pocock in his older years coming to regattas, and I'm, you know, I'm sure helping helping coach some of those younger rowers as well. So um, we're just really proud to kind of have that tie um, and the enthusiasm of the family to to kind of, again, use this opportunity to, to promote his legacy and just thinking about everything you do is not just something you're doing now, but setting the stage for the way things are, you know, the, the future community that we live in. So I'm going to just ask if anyone has a question, they can feel free to either type it in the um, in the chat box or open their microphone. Uh, just unmute yourself and let us hear your question about this. I'm uh, I'm curious. Obviously, we uh, are going to have this wonderful thing in the uh, the wonderful boat in the. Um, great room and hallway of the upper story, as you said, of this boathouse. Um, but the timeline for actually 
making that visible to the public or when it's ready for use is a little ways off, isn't it? I can take that, Bill. Um, yeah, so I think it, we're actually, <clears throat> the plan is to hang it this week. Um, ideally, you know, in a non-COVID world, even though the rowing center isn't finished, we could bring, bring tours of people through um, and and check out the, I mean, the up, upper floor of the rowing center has got a, just a big glass wall, <clears throat> two glass walls looking out over Eagle Harbor. It's it, it's stunning. It looks really beautiful. Um, do you have, Reed, did you flip through the picture of the group, rowing, the group with the shell in the rowing center? Did I, I have I have a no. I have a picture of uh, standing in the. Let me see if I can get back to that. Um, but now I think the wall behind in the other direction. And no, it was like kind of a. Oh, this is this was, That's it there. Yeah, so that's the rowing center. Now it's it's we're further along, so it's all glassed in. Um, and then I think it's not, we don't have a certificate of occupancy to actually use it for programs yet because it's unfinished and there's not bathrooms accessible and whatnot upstairs. But in a perfect world, we'd be able to bring tours through there safely. Um, and, you know, when we get to a phase three, we can go ahead and do that. Um, I would say uh, peeking in the windows is going to be the best way <laughs> to do it for the next couple of weeks. Um, and yeah. we've seen plenty of people doing that, so that's okay. Good. Yeah, uh, that's that's great. And the rowing that you have now completed a major part of the construction for the purposes of uh, the rowing program, right? Yeah, so the downstairs is really finished. It's I was telling Reed before everyone joined in, it's the bitter irony is that we've been working so hard for so many years to put our roof over our heads, and we finally have a roof over our heads right before we all had to run for cover. <laughs> so um, yeah, for our purposes, the downstairs is finished. Ideally, we'd like to expand programs into the upstairs. That's sort of the design was to have, a, we have a large closet where we can roll all of the rowing machines in and out of the way. There's rooms for space for classroom learning. There's two locker rooms up there. Um, but really the, the big purpose of designing something so ex like so over the top of what we needed was that, it's, we're part of a community, we're part of the community park. And um, we really needed to, to, to honor that by creating a second story that would work for the community for events, for weddings, for gathering spaces, um, you know, for programs for the senior center, you know, ideally. And so we're all of these um, things led us to have this, it's a beautiful, I don't know if everybody realizes it's James Cutler, Jim Cutler is the local architect that designed it. So, and this has a lot of that same look. It just, you really feel connected to outdoors, to the harbor, to the view, to the park when you're in that space. Um, so I kind of forgot where I was going with all of this, but that's that's our plan now. Um, and then, so that's what we called the, the uh, core and shell. Um, and so that's all done. And now that's part of, that's the end of that phase. And the next phase, now we have to raise some more funds to get to the next phase. And that'll be, I think it's $1.2 million gets everything finished off with bathrooms, handicapped accessible bathrooms, a little kitchen um, that has windows that open out to the outside um, to like a pass-through windows. And then um, all the spaces and all the, you know, HVAC and everything else that we need to get the whole thing coming along. Mm -hmm. Well, I really uh, find this fascinating, and it must have been an enormous uh, amount of work by a, by a number of people also coming together with the tools for the community, the barn and uh, woodworkers and a few uh, people willing to take windows out and put them back in. <laughs> Um, I don't want to undervalue Bill Booth's uh, contributions to being only to the to to the restoration uh, the preservation of the rowing shell. He's been in it for the long haul, just the development of this building and the structure and the vision for what our rowing center is going to look like for how many years has it been, Bill? Oh, has it been four or five? Yeah, quite a while, and all volunteer. He's just we, he's a just we're, he's a gem. We're lucky to have him. Well, thank you both for coming today and uh, sharing these photos. Absolutely stunning. Good pleasure to be there. Thank you for uh, presenting this uh, to your uh, to your uh, community.